Thanks for coming out on what Snoopy would say is a dark and rainy night. Uh, we're glad to see all of you here. I'm John Jackson from the Paul Simon Institute. I'm standing in for our director, David Yepsen, who unfortunately had a scheduling conflict and is uh, completely out of town in Northern Illinois giving a speech tonight. So he sends his regards uh, and his regrets. If David were here though, the first thing he would want me to do is a quick commercial for our next event, uh, which is going to be Monday, a week from this Monday, which is November the 16th. It's going to be a luncheon over at the Stadium Club, uh, which is attached to the football field, for some of you know that and some of you may not. Uh, and it's going to be a discussion of the upcoming primary caucus season and then of the presidential elections. And it's going to be David Yepsen, uh, Charlie Leonard, who is director of polling at the Paul Simon Institute, and me. And we're going to tell you what's going to happen and predict who's going to win. Well, kind of with a lot of caveats and a lot of conditional probability statements and whatnot. But we think it'll be interesting, so uh, we'd be glad to have all of you join us. Uh, lunch starts at 11.30, and then the speaking will start about 12 o'clock. Again, that's Monday, November the 16th. Uh, I see State Representative Terry Bryant uh, from Murfreesboro. We're glad to have you here tonight uh, with uh, the leader. and. Uh, we appreciate your coming to other of our events. Uh, President Randy Dunn is going to give a uh, introduction to our speaker, and I want to say before he comes up, uh, he's here on a dark and rainy night, but he's here a lot of other nights and a lot of other events that we at the Institute uh, sponsor. And we know how hectic his calendar is and how overcommitted he often is, so. We particularly appreciate his support. President Dunn. Thank you, John. And just as uh, John is standing in for Director Yepsen tonight, I'm doing uh, duty for Chancellor Brad Caldwell, who sends his regrets, but glad to join everyone and, and certainly to welcome you here to SIU Carbondale. And I do have the uh, honor of introducing to you our speaker for tonight, House Republican leader Jim Durkin. Jim Durkin was raised in the western suburb of Westchester, graduated from Fenwick High School. Not a classmate of Governor Quinn, I'm assuming. Uh, I say no. uh, but faithful alum. Faithful alum uh, no, that's, uh, I understood. <laughs> he attended Illinois State University and earned a degree in criminal justice and received the Juris Doctor degree from the John Marshall Law School. Following law school, he served as an assistant Illinois Attorney General and assistant Cook County State's Attorney, serving the Felony Trial and Narcotics Bureaus, and he currently practices law in the city of Chicago. In January 1995, Jim became an Illinois State Representative, serving the 44th District, where he remained until launching a bid for the U.S. Senate in 2002. In 2006, he was appointed to fill a vacancy in the 82nd House District and has successfully run for re-election since that time. He served as ranking Republican on the Illinois House of Representatives Special Investigation Committee for the impeachment of Governor Blagojevich in 2008, and then in 2012 was House Manager for the removal of a sitting member of the Illinois House of Representatives. In August 2013, Jim was unanimously selected by his fellow Republicans to fill the vacancy of House Republican leader, which he assumed on October 22, 2013, and certainly, as you know, has remained in that position since that time. Leader Durkin currently resides in Western Springs with his wife and family, has received numerous awards for his government and community service. I could mention all of these, but I do want to point out a couple, uh, particularly given the education connection. Uh, the Illinois Community College Trustee Association named him Legislator of the Year in 1997, and then most recently was named 2015 Outstanding Legislator of the Year by the Illinois Association of Parks District. As you follow the media, know generally 
all of the university presidents have been making their treks to Springfield, have been asking for time in, in the leader's offices, and I will tell you, Leader Durkin has been uh, uh, most gracious, always willing to meet, always willing to talk, carries education at the top of his agenda, and Leader, we appreciate that. We know that we have tough times to go through, but there's always a, an open door and a listening ear, and that's well appreciated by all of us in higher education. You need to show him by your welcome that we value the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute as a gem of Southern Illinois University. Give him a great Saluki welcome, Illinois House Republican Leader Jim Durkin. Thanks, everyone. Wow, look at this. It's progress. Hey, Randy, you uh, pretty much did half of my speech, so, you know. Uh, but thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's great to be at Southern Illinois University, home of the Salukis. Um, I just mentioned one thing. You talked about the Illinois Community College Trustee Association. Now, I'll tell you how I got started in politics. That's what I was, was a junior college board member back in 1990. I was a uh, single. I was a young prosecutor. I had a little time, and I wanted to, you know, contribute more to public uh, service. And uh, the Community College Board at Triton had awarded themselves American Express gold cards and all their administration. I was outraged and I decided I'm not gonna be that guy that sits on the sidelines and just kind of uh, mopes and complains. I'm gonna do something about it. So I ran in a race for two seats, 13 people ran, and I'm in the southern part of the district. And if you're familiar with the, uh, the west suburbs, Triton College was controlled by the Melrose Park Democrat machine. Uh, Harry, you might be familiar with some of those characters. In any event, they never lose, but I won. And the first order of business we did is I eliminated the American Express gold cards. So I really, I took that, uh, that attitude, if you really, are, really want to do something about changing things, run for office and, and, and stick with your principles and get it done. So. I have no credit card for the university. <laughs> you don't, but your assistant and your administrators, it's another story. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I wouldn't, before I get into this, I also want to introduce my, my good friend and colleague, uh, Terry Bryant, who's here. Terry, thank you for joining us. Terry has uh, done a great job in her first, she's walked into a really interesting time in, uh, in, in Springfield, and we'll get into that, but I just uh, think Terry's done a marvelous job of uh, taking on a tough position, uh, but also being very aggressive and representing her district. She has two full-time offices for constituent services, but she also has not been afraid to stand up and, and try to pass legislation, which is not an easy thing to do as a freshman, because trust me, when you're in the minority party, I did for years, I was one of those guys who was a mouthpiece on the floor, so whenever there was a freshman legislator, we knew that, oh boy, they're just ready. So I would be one of those guys, a couple of us lawyers, and we would just really pick apart the bills and sometimes not make things very easy for them. So anyway, it's very difficult being a freshman, but I will say this, Terry has done, I can think of this session alone, there hasn't been a lot of bills passed. The ones that have been passed, most of them have been vetoed by the governor, and a lot of them have died this summer with veto overrides. But Terry uh, has an amazing record that she's passed four pieces of legislation that have become law. Uh, two of them dealing with uh, oil and mineral rights, one with uh, fracking, another one with the uh, National Guard, uh, and uh, got here another one with uh, the, our vehicle code. Uh, one vote, the vehicle code was 114 to zero. National Guard bill was 105 to zero. The oil and gas regulatory fund regulatory fund bill was 115 to zero, and another one dealing with fracking 113 to zero. So you were able to pass all four of your bills without any dissent in the House of Representatives. Now, Terry, if we return next year, hopefully we'll get back to the regular course of business. And if you're able to be able to have the same type of success, you will be nicknamed landslide. So, <laughs> landslide Bryant, I like it. So, uh, I think. Uh, you know, it's just, like I said, it's great to be down here. Uh, I know that I, you know, I've got to, when I make speeches and I go places, I just try to learn a little bit about the area a little bit more so I can, you know, just talk, talk a little bit about this guy from the west suburbs. What does he know about Southern Illinois University? Since I, I, I not much, but I, I'm, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. But uh, I knew that one time the nickname for the, at Southern Illinois was the Maroons up until 1953. And I know it came down at that time, a choice of, Switching, uh, changing the name of the mascot from the Rebels to the Salukis. 
And I'm really glad that you picked the Saluki, because I tell you right now, in this world of political correctness, I don't think the SIU rebels would have gone over real well, and trust me, it would have been a, it would have been a tough time in the campus. But, uh, but uh, as you all know, a Saluki is a, a canine that is bred from the Fertile Crescent, and I think our institutions of higher learning are places that we can call Fertile Crescents for thinking and also people expressing the ideas. Uh, but the Saluki, if you look it up under the Wikipedia page, uh, which is a source of all information in the world these days, it's, uh, a Saluki is defined as an independent breed. Independent, I like to think that I, SIU is an independent institution, very independent minds. But also, a Saluki needs patient training. But they are gentle and affectionate, so I'm in a crowd of Saluki, so you will be patient, gentle, and affectionate, hopefully, to me this evening. <laughs> But also, with this one last statement, if you look on there, but Salukis can also be very bored and can be bored easily. So that is my, hopefully will not be my gift to you. But I will say this, that uh, I understand that the last, I'm the last of the four legislative leaders to be invited to speak to you. But as the old saying goes, save the best for last, or we start with the shortest and we go to the tallest, or you finally ran out of options. Pick one of the three, and they all work for me. So. But seriously, I have a great respect for the Paul Simon Institute. Uh, it's an independent, nonpartisan organization which provides lawmakers with information which we may not have otherwise to help us with our decision making. Uh, and I tell you what, we certainly could use that help right now in Springfield. So uh, we, we could use that help, but uh, you're a great resource. And Randy, again, thank you for coming down and visiting me. Uh, I think it's really important when, when folks come to visit us in Springfield, uh, no matter what the situation is, we give them time. You come to my office. My door is always open. I don't, whether university president or if it's someone uh, you know who's just come down as angry about an issue, I'll give them your time. I think it's important that we extend that courtesy and respect to the citizens of Illinois to be responsive to them. We may not agree, but the fact is, I think it's important that we allow men and women to come and speak their mind about what they think is going on in Springfield. Uh, so, I want to thank the uh, institute for their hard work. Uh, David Yepsen is not here. Uh, and Randy, you can tell them that I've used that excuse before. I've got to give a speech up north. Because I told my wife that, she goes, where are you going today? I'm giving a speech down south. And she goes, yeah, right. I've heard that before. So anyway, you can extend it to David. It's a great excuse. I've used it. But I am, if my wife ever calls, say that Jim Durkin was here. And uh, it was not an excuse. Because, yeah. uh, you know, this job also takes me on the road. So, uh, But I, I remember David Yepsen. And I'm, I'm disappointed he isn't here. I, I've never met him. but. I can just remember so many Sunday mornings, and a lot of us did, just watching Tim Russert and David Epson talk about the Iowa caucuses, which are just around the corner. So you've got an absolute gem in David Epson here. You're very fortunate to have him here. And I tell you what, I can't think of a better place to be if you want to hear about the next cycle, is hear about David Epson, give his predictions, and analyze this, this really convoluted, interesting process called the Iowa caucuses. So uh, anyway, you're very fortunate to have him. But uh, David has big shoes to fill. Uh, and he's been, you know, following the lead of some great giants in government, uh, Paul Simon, obviously, and Mike Lawrence. Uh, these men share a deep concern for the state of Illinois, SIU, and also for good government. All three, you know, Paul Simon, Mike Lawrence, and Dave Yepsen are known for their honesty and high ethical standards, attributes that I admire, and that's what all public servants must strive for. Mike Lawrence, I'm not sure if he's here or not, but I just say this, that I've known him uh, for many years, and I hold him in the highest of regards. Uh, he's a fine man. I see him in at Springfield on a regular basis, and I know he's very proud of this institution and what you're doing here. I'm friends with his daughter, and she's a, a tremendous advocate in Springfield. I know he's very proud of her. I know Mike's not here, but uh, please tell him that I extend my best to him, because he's an absolute champion. Now, Paul Simon, as we you probably heard this story over and over again, he started a newspaper business, borrowed about $3,000 to take over a defunct newspaper in Troy. $3,000 is about what I raised in the general election against Dick Durbin. So that's my connection with uh, Paul Simon. He started with a newspaper. My $3,000, uh, uh, we can get into that. Uh, but So that's my connection with Paul Simon is $3,000. So uh, he wrote the first book about Abe Lincoln's time as an Illinois legislator. Uh, for most people, that would be a success enough. But he went on to just an amazing political career in the legislature where he advocated for civil rights. Uh, this was at a time when he adopted wearing his trademark bow ties and horn rim glasses. So when we all see someone in a bow tie 
it makes us think of Paul Simon. And I'm pretty sure that that bow tie was not a clip-on. What do you think? Yeah, uh, but I, if somebody can teach me how to tie a bow tie, please, uh, I'm, I'm, I need help. So uh, and I, I'm not quite sure I'd look with a bow tie, but uh, maybe one of these days we'll try it. But uh, Paul Simon went on to serve in the legislature before becoming lieutenant governor for Illinois. That's when the Ogilvy Simon ticket was in Illinois. It was the only time in Illinois history when a Republican and Democrat were elected governor and lieutenant governor from different parties. You have to wonder how that would work in our current political climate. <laughs> Not too well. It would make for even more amazing theater than what you've seen over the past few months. But uh, Paul Simon was considered a fiscal conservative, well, not successful. He worked with Republican Senator Orrin Hatch to co-author the Balanced Budget Amendment. Imagine an Illinois Democrat seeking to pass a balanced, balanced budget amendment. Well, I will tell you right now, in Springfield, I don't think we'll have any takers from the other side of the aisle on that, but uh, that's a joke. You guys can laugh if you want. But, that's, uh, all right, all right. but Paul Simon's political career came to an end when he failed to secure the Democrat presidential nomination in 1988, but rather go, than go into retirement, he devoted himself to the policy, public policy with the SIU Public Policy Institute in teaching. Because of his efforts, I am here to speak uh, to you tonight. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. You probably already heard this, but I represent the 82nd district in the west suburbs of Cook County. I was born and raised in Westchester, Illinois, but that's my district is Cook, DuPage, and Will County. It may sound great, but, not, but that, the problem is I got to deal with three different political organizations. That's three meetings that I have to go almost on a weekly basis. So uh, be careful what you wish for. I was initially became a, a, a legislator in 1995. I uh, was appointed to uh, fill a vacancy and served until 2002. Uh, prior to becoming the lawmaker, I was a prosecutor, a job that I loved. I was a prosecutor in Chicago with the Attorney General Office, and then I was with the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. And, uh, uh, I learned the hard way how to try cases. Uh, it was a fascinating uh, time in my life. I was a young lawyer, uh, but many of my brothers also filled in that position. They were county prosecutors, federal prosecutors. I grew up watching them in a courtroom, uh, meting out justice for people who've, uh, who've, who clearly have done things wrong uh, and trying to help victims put some sanity back in their life by bringing conclusion to their grief. Uh, but it's something which uh, I clearly enjoyed. It was important, it was responsible. But as a young lawyer, there was a better training ground anywhere than the criminal courthouse in Cook County. Uh, but I took a break from the Illinois General Assembly in 2002 to run as a Republican nominee for the United States Senate. And I can tell you, uh, in 2002 was a very forgettable year for the party and for Republicans. United States Senator Dick Durbin was reelected, and the state of Illinois welcomed Governor Rod Blagojevich. So anyway, that experience, running as a US Senator, really gave me a, a really great understanding of the state of Illinois. Uh, I, I f quickly realized that the world doesn't revolve around the west suburbs of Cook County. So uh, I would travel at that time. I didn't have the luxury of having a jet to fly me all over the state of Illinois, so I, I, I ran my car into the ground for basically, you know, for 12 months. But I had just an amazing time just learning and talking to people in all parts of the state, whether it's in the northwest part of the state, central Illinois, the inner city of Chicago, central Illinois, southeast Illinois, southern Illinois. Uh, it really gave me a really good perspective of what people think and how, they, uh, how we have differences of opinion. But that has given me the ability, I think, to serve in this position as leader. I have 47, I'm one of 47 members, and from all over the state. My job is to, kind of like herding cats at times, but it's to understand what's important for them. Uh, because what may be important for me is not exactly important for my friends who are in the Metro East area. But I need to be able to understand that and appreciate that. So running for the United States Senate gave me that understanding of what's important in regions, but also to respect the opinions of my friends and their constituents in all parts of the state. Because when we convene in Springfield, we have a lot of, a lot of bills and a lot of issues that come around, but I've been able to understand and, and appreciate the regional differences, but also not only appreciate but respect the regional differences that we have in the state of Illinois. And I think that's extremely important for every legislator. Uh, I'm not saying you should run for statewide office or run for the United States Senate so you can get clobbered by Dick Durbin, but what I would say that it's really good for people to visit colleagues in other regions of the state, whether it's Democrat or Republican, get to know the people, talk to the people in the coffee shop, because it really is a beautiful state. And I will tell you, during that experience, just driving around and going to these local small counties and just 
going to the local courthouse or the town square is something that I had never experienced growing up in the west suburbs of Cook County, which are concrete jungles. So I really had a great time visiting, uh, whether it's Fayette County, Bond County, uh, White County, Saline County. It's just, uh, I really enjoyed it so much. Uh, but uh, after repeatedly, after I told my wife this many times after 2002, after repeatedly vowing never to return to public office after getting, as I said, clobbered by Senator Durbin, I returned to the Illinois General Assembly in September of 2006. And as uh, Randy said, I served as the uh, ranking Republican on the impeachment committee for Rapogoyevich. And in 2012, I was the House manager, which is basically code for prosecutor, uh, for the removal of a sitting member of the Illinois House of Representatives. Uh, both men are currently paying their respective debts to society in federal penitentiaries. So I think I did my job well, and I did it right. Uh, those were not shiny moments in Illinois history. But I'm proud of my role and my responsibility in both of those matters. I didn't, I didn't treasure it. It's not something that I, I, you know, I gloat about, but it was something that we had to do. But I look at those two roles and positions I had. It was uh, an extension of what I felt that I was doing as a prosecutor in Chicago. And, uh, but it was due process issues. We had procedural issues that we had to deal with. And I think I did a good job. But I thought it was complimented the training that I had. I was first elected House leader by my peers in August of 2013 and was officially inaugurated that October of 2013. At that time, our caucus was extremely divided. I was running against a uh, gentleman from Sangamon County, Springfield, Raymond Poe. And it was a divide between the northern members of the legislature for the southern members of the legislature. So I spent the whole summer traveling to say it again. It was like running in that Senate race again. But for me, we're, when we're in Springfield, we don't get a lot of time to talk to each other. And uh, sometimes we characterize a, a, a day in the life of a legislator. Uh, when you come talk to them, it's almost as if they're, uh, they have the attention span of gnats. We, uh, we've got so many things that are going on. So many bills, so many people are twisting and turning us. It's very difficult to be able to talk to people and find out what's important. So I got in the car again, drove around the state, talked to my colleagues at length. Uh, and uh, again, it's important that I do that, that I keep stay balanced, that I understand what's important for them, what is the issue that they think they need from me as a leader, what they expect from me as leader, what's important for their constituents. So I did that again. And at the time, it was still a divided caucus. but. Uh, the important thing when we met for my selection is that we walked in kind of divided. We left united because I was uh, appointed unanimously with Raymond Poe nominating me, my challenger, as the uh, Republican leader. So as I look at that, it was a very important moment for us as a caucus because uh, teamwork is very important, but we have to stick together. That's what it's about, teamwork. And we're going to sink or swim as a caucus. And uh, I'm still, uh, and today we've, we've really been tested over the past uh, 10 months with the, uh, with, the new, with, the, with the change in the administration, but also the division in the, in, in, in the Capitol. But our caucus is still unified. And uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, I am one of eight boys. Uh, we grew up in a three bedroom, two bathroom house in Westchester, Illinois. And you heard that correctly, eight boys, two bathrooms, one for my parents and one for us. So let me be very clear. I've seen everything. Nothing is going to shake me. Nothing is going to scare me. Any of you who would have lived with me for a year, you would be in the same position. My, my dear mother, and I miss her tremendously, but in about 1988, uh, we all slept in the upstairs. And we had the one bathroom upstairs. She, 1988, she decided that, guys, I'm done. I'm not going up there. If you want to live that way, it's up to you. But in any event, you'll learn a lot of things like that. But our brothers are very close. Uh, and. Uh, we got a very strong family, but I will just say this about my parents. It's, uh, you know, you, you talk about generations and, I don't, and about how great they were. My parents come from an amazing generation. Both of them have passed within the last year and a half. And uh, it's, you know, we miss them tremendously, but they sacrificed for us. My father was a very successful accountant, but he raised eight, eight sons. Uh, their goal was to make sure that we were able to attend school and to reach for the stars to whatever we felt our American dream was. Uh, they encouraged us to do that. Um, and I'm proud to say that all eight of us graduated from the same grammar school. All eight of us graduated from the same high school. All eight of us graduated from college. Five of us are practicing attorneys in Chicago. Of the five, three are CPAs. So my parents sacrificed a lot, but they also, it's something that when they're looking down, they, I know they're very proud too. So 
uh, but they, they sacrificed, but they made it a better life for us. Uh, I said that you know, four of my brothers were, were lawyers. We all practiced law in Chicago. Uh, three of them are, are accountants. I got three other brothers who've done very well. They're all, one's involved with human resources, the other one in insurance, the other one's in the banking industry. Uh, I went to John Marshall Law School, Illinois State University. Uh, but again, I can't emphasize enough what it meant for us to be able to grow up in a time in this state where sacrifice was made for children to ensure that they would be able to pursue their dream in education, but also to pursue a dream, uh, their, their, the American dream of finding a job in the state of Illinois, like we did. How great is that as a grandparent or a parent to know that you have been able to see your children grow and watch them succeed, but more importantly, they're close, they're within a drive, they want to stay here. Uh, I, I, I remember, and it's something that I feel very strong about and it's important as we talk about what's going on in Springfield. I remember during the campaign last year, I was talking to one of our candidates and I just said, why are you running? And she said, it's real simple. My son graduated, for, graduated from the University of Illinois with a degree in engineering, one of the best engineering schools in the world but he couldn't find a job in the state of Illinois. He had to go to Texas, and that's why I'm running, because I'm mad, and I'm like, wow. And you know, I hear those stories all the time. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, just to get a little more of my personal background, I'm a father of a teenage daughter, and I have three stepdaughters, uh, but just remember, I'm also I'm a father, I'm a legislator, I'm a taxpayer, and a husband, too. So I, uh, little known secret, but we still pay taxes as, as legislators. I just want to make sure you know that. So. Uh, I'm, but I am concerned about my, my, my daughter and my stepdaughters, their future, about what is going to be down the road for them. Uh, I'm worried about where my daughter will choose college. I want her to stay in Illinois. Uh, will she stay here? I hope so. And when she, if she's successful and, and gets her, her degree, that I hope that she finds a job here in Illinois. It was a lot easier for me back in my time when I graduated in 1983. It's not that easy for kids these days. But I also worry about whatever career she decides to pursue, I question whether there will be jobs available for her in Illinois or will she have to move away. That would be tragic. To the students in this room, the reason you attend SIU and study hard is to gain knowledge and learn skills that will prepare you for the workforce and the career of your choice. That is the core mission of this institution and they do a fine job. Randy, you do a fine job. Thank you. I know that your family, your friends, professors and I want you to pursue your professional or public career in the state but we have a lot of work ahead of us to, to convince you that that is still going to be an option for you down the road. Because I know that people question about the policies of what's happening to this state. We're in the midst of it right now. But we've got to be able to make the case and prove to everybody in this room that Illinois is still a good investment of why you should stay here. We've got to make this a better state. We need to reverse the trend of the young talent leaving Illinois uh, for other states. So, which gets us to the heart of the current budget impasse. I'll start with some good news. Illinois' unemployment number is headed downward. The rate is 5.4% for this September. It's down from 56 in August. But that number doesn't exactly tell the whole story. This rate ignores those individuals who have been out of work for so long that they have been, that they've given up looking, the underemployed and those who are involuntarily working in part-time basis rather than full-time. Based on the formula that determined the hidden unemployment rate at the federal level, we can assume that an estimated rate in Illinois for September of 2015 of that type of unemployment, we're taking in all those factors, is over 10%, it's about 10.6%. Um, last month, the Department of Employment Security said the drop in the jobless rate in September was not caused by net new hiring, and stated that Illinois has only added 2,200 jobs since the start of 2015. I'm going to go through some numbers here, but I think it's important. Illinois continues to lag behind the nation in terms of job, in terms of job growth. Illinois still has the highest unemployment of all of its neighboring states. Illinois, 5.4%, Indiana, 4.5%, Iowa, 3.6%, Kentucky, 5.0%, Missouri, 5.3%, Wisconsin, 4.3%. That is not where I want to see us. We're not, you know, yeah, we're number one, but it's not a good number one. It's unfortunate. A recent report by an independent uh, blog in Chicago called Reboot Illinois tracked job creation in Illinois over a five-year period covering much of this recession. Between 2000, June of 2009 and June of 2014, Illinois ranked 42 amongst the 50 states for job creation. During the same period, jobs in Wisconsin increased by 4.5%, Iowa by 5%, Kentucky saw 5.1%, more jobs in Indiana, 7.8%. 
Illinois had a total of 5.9 million jobs in September. That's the same number of jobs we had in 1998. These figures are the consequences of our longstanding reputation of being, I think, a high tax state, but also a state that's considered unfriendly to our business, uh, our, our business friends. What happens is that there are fewer jobs. When there's fewer jobs, residents pack up and move. We've seen that over the past few years. The trend continues, according to the U.S. Census data, between July 2013 and July 2014. Illinois' population shrank by about 10,000 residents. Illinois suffered a net loss of nearly 95,000 people in state-to-state -state migration last year. That's the biggest contributor to the overall population decline. Why should we care? Why is this important? Fewer residents means fewer taxes to support our schools, our park districts, and also our state and local governments. It also affects our consumer and retail markets because they're struggling as well, but it is a very vicious cycle. It just comes down to basic math, folks. The cost of operating government is on the rise. Each year it costs more and more to pay for our schools, health care, pensions, infrastructure, and public safety. Plus, we are on the hook for years of overspending to expand and create new programs without having the adequate revenues to support the additional spending. We've seen that time and time again. When you have a reduced number of residents contributing to the tax base, you have few do fewer dollars to spend, and the debt burden is heavier on those who remain. And unfortunately, that could be that next generation unless we do something, do something soon. But Illinois is clearly at a crossroads, and for the sake of your generation and for future generations, we have to get ourselves on a different path. Today, we are 120 days without a state budget. Many of us had hoped a resolution by now, and we share, I share in your frustration. I would be lying if I said that I was sleeping well at night. I know that the pain is real, and I am concerned about those caught in the middle. Higher ed is the largest piece of the puzzle that remains to be funded. Unlike other services, there's no continuing appropriation for higher ed. There's no court order out of the Metro East or Cook County nor is there a consent decree out of one of our federal courts demanding that these monies be spent and sent to the uh, universities. Higher ed funding took major hits under the previous two administrations, and as a result, the cost of higher ed is becoming unaffordable for many families. It is a major concern for me. I went to Illinois State University from 1980. I went to Loyola for one year. I went to ISU from 80 to 83. Uh, in the summer, I would work for a bottling plant. I know there's a bottler here up in Chicago. It was 7-Up. But the fact is, I made good wages. Uh, I was a teamster, and I was able to pay for my college education from the work I did in the bottling plant. Can you think of it right now of any job that a kid can do over the summer that's going to be able to pay for his education? It doesn't happen anymore. But this is only 20 years ago, 25 years ago. I mean, just think about it. And I'm sorry, guys, but I, we could do that. We could work the summer jobs, and we would be able to pay for that ISU, uh, that, that $4,000 tuition bill. And uh, it's painful, and I'm sorry. Now, my hope is that the current impasse that we have with our budget will lead to long-term solutions, not matters which we're going to kick down the road, that will strengthen our higher education systems and eventually stabilize tuition rates for students. But just last week, President Dunn, thank you. It takes a little pressure off me tonight, but you stated that the SIU system, SIU system will be fully operational through the next semester and MAP will be funded as well. Thank you for your part and for the sacrifices that the university is making in this tough time. And uh, I hope the students appreciate that as well. But because most state employees are getting paid and schools, hospitals are open and road construction is still going on, if you go into the city of Chicago, you can't go anywhere without stepping into a ditch or knocking into some type of construction equipment, which is great. Uh, but there hasn't been that much outrage over the budget. I'm hearing it. There hasn't been most of the summer, but, the, is, but it's beginning to change right now. Now, as the pressure builds, many are saying just pass a budget, just get it over with. Deal with reforms later. Let me just give you a quick history lesson. Back in January of 2011, the Democrat majority, during a lame duck session, they controlled both chambers. Uh, Governor Quinn had just won his election, and in the 11th hour of a lame duck session, uh, passed the largest tax increase on families and businesses um, in Illinois history. And the middle class was not exempted from that tax. 
At that time, we had high unemployment, a hefty backlog of unpaid bills, mounting pension debt, unsustainable Medicaid growth, and not enough money to meet our state's infrastructure needs. I remember it as, like it was yesterday, the Democrats on the floor stating that this tax increase would solve our problems. It would pay the bills, new jobs would be created, all the ills of Illinois would go away. Well, we collected $36 billion, additional dollars during that four-year period. Uh, it didn't do anything to pay the backlog. We're currently at $6.7 billion backlog. Our pension debt is still skyrocketing. All it did was go to our public pension payments. That tax increase from four and a half years ago was sold on false, pre pre excuse me, on false pretenses. It didn't do anything to solve the problems that we had. Republicans at that time, myself, refused to go along with the tax hike. We didn't support it because we just didn't trust the majority party with the money, what they were going to do with that money at that time. And I believe we were right. We advocated passing reforms like we do every year back then to rein in state spending, grow jobs, which fell on deaf ears. Governor Rauner is doing exactly what he said he would do when he ran for office. He is demanding reforms in state government to make us more competitive with other states. We're losing to our states that are around us. I gave you those numbers about the unemployment rates. Theirs are going down, ours are going up. We have to be more competitive. But right now, when people say just pass a budget, if we back down, nothing's going to change. But let me be clear that Governor Rauner has made concessions. He had a reform agenda, started about 40 items at the beginning of the year, but now he's down to five. Term limits, redistricting reform, work comp reform, tort reform, and property tax freezes. Now, that didn't go over real well with the uh, majority party since they've been running Springfield for the past 12 years. They're not used to having someone like Governor Rauner in that position. They just said, look, we know we need revenue just past the budget. The governor has said, no, we have to be able to good. We have to be able to be a government that people trust, one which is going to demand reforms and how we conduct business, but how, how we also run this state and how we generate employment and put people back to work. Um, we cannot simply raise taxes and keep doing what we've been doing. This combination will require a number of things. Some of the options include cutting programs and services, uh, making Illinois a better business-friendly state. And I talked a few about a few of those things, mainly workman's compensation reform, reform. We have to do some things with our unemployment insurance. We may have a deal on that next week. Um, and also giving our schools some flexibility in our local governments uh, with their own budgets. Uh, but I will say this. There's been a lot of rhetoric said over the past few months. Some people believe the governor has not been, um, has not made any concessions. He's been too, too strident with his positions. But I will say this. We talk about reasonableness. The governor has stated, a Republican governor, that he's open for revenue. There probably is a case that maybe there needs to be some more revenue. He's already come a little bit along the way. The Democrat majority, when the governor says, look, I have priorities about fixing Illinois, about doing, making some changes to our workmen's compensation system, but also addressing some of our issues with local property taxes. They have moved not one inch. So you need to be reasonable. The governor has stated that I'm willing to discuss the priority of the majority party. That's revenue. But the majority party is not willing to discuss or to say that we're willing to try to find some type of common ground on your priorities. So that's where we're at right now, folks. Republicans proved that we're willing to do the heavy lifting when we worked with Governor Rauner and the Democrats to fill the FY15 budget shortfall. But we want, and we want to work with Democrats to find common ground on much needed reforms and crafting a responsible budget. We will be part of the solution. But it can't be one-sided, take it or leave it, like it has been for the past many years and like it was this, November, this May when the Democrats passed a budget that was $4 billion out of balance. The governor did the responsible thing by vetoing it. He's been trying to get the folks to the table. He's offered that many times. We need to negotiate. We need to negotiate. Now we're going to meet again on November 18th in Chicago. There's going to be a meeting of the four legislative leaders and also the governor. And it's my hope that we will be able to walk into that meeting with open minds, understanding that there needs to be some give and take from both sides. I'm willing to do that. The governor's willing to do that. And it's my hope that the Speaker and the President of the Senate will come in with that same attitude. If they do, 
we can find a common ground on what's important to them and what's important for us. Because that's what you need when you have a divided government. There needs to be some sacrifice, but each side needs to be able to give in it a little bit. That's what negotiation's about. Um, but uh, we're, things have been challenging, uh, but I do believe that there is a pathway for us to get out of this impasse, but it's gonna require cooperation. And that's got a, that's a two-way street. Now, I just wanna thank you. I probably talked more than I should, but uh, you've been very patient, and uh, I will ask you to continue to be patient. I'm hopeful that this meeting on November 18th, that there'll be something productive from that. I'm going in with good intentions. Nothing's going to happen on the 18th. I don't think that we're going to have this eureka moment, but the fact is my goal is that we can hopefully walk out with a framework of what all of us think we need to do or what we can agree on to be able to solve this impasse. Um, while there is tremendous uh, uncertainty, I am optimistic that we will get to the point where we can reach agreement on key points and we, where we will find a solution to our budget crisis. Now, I'm talking to a good audience. I talked about how Salukis are patient, and I know you can be patient. The Saluki dog is patient, so I know it's in your blood, so thank you so much. Uh, just one few things I just want to say that it's, uh, I love my state. All of us in this room love your, this state. I was raised here, and I talked about my background and how I've been able to be successful through hard work, my parents' sacrifice. I worked hard. All these young men and women here, I know are working hard. They want the same opportunities as you have and that I have. I'm willing to make the sacrifices. I'm willing to make the tough votes, whatever they may be, to ensure that the generation in this room and generations afterwards are not gonna have to clean up the mess that was created years and years and over many generations. We have to get the job done now for these young kids in this room. So that's what we're gonna do. That's what I'm committed to doing. And uh, I hope we can get there. I think we will. But the fact is, it may get a little tougher before it gets a little bit better. But I think everybody knew that this day was gonna come when Governor Rauner was elected. So folks, again, this is a great, uh, great honor for me to be here. Uh, to speak at the Paul Simon Institute. I can't believe me, Jim Durkin, guy out of the western, western suburbs of Illinois, one of eight guys who played basketball in his backyard and you know, is, is speaking at the Paul Simon Institute. And uh, as I said earlier, I know my parents are looking down with a smile on their face. And uh, I know my brothers are proud of me and I'm proud of them as well. But uh, I've, Terry, I, one thing that I, I said that uh, in January when I was uh, sworn in and I was made the minority leader again, uh, I'd tell my members that, you know, it's always an honor and it's a privilege to be sworn into the House of Representatives, but you are being sworn in at probably one of the most fascinating times in Illinois history. So let's make the best of it. Terry, and, let, and Terry, we're going to make the best of it. So folks, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot at stake, uh, but we're willing to just know when I say this, I'm willing to make the sacrifices that are important for you, important for your children and grandchildren. I want this state to be the state that I grew up in. I want it to be quickly, because it sickens me when I give you the, when I read off those numbers about what has happened to our state, our beautiful state. Uh, I want to make Illinois the state that we can always be proud of, one which our children will never want to leave. Our children will want to raise their families, and your grandchildren will, will stay here. I think we have an obligation in Springfield to do that for them. So that's what's at stake, folks. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and uh, I'm glad to take a few questions. Now, uh, wing, I, I, 8.30 is probably the <laughs> time which we, I just want to make sure that we're, we're, we're on a schedule, but we got a little time. Are we going to have a tax increase, and if so, what kind? I can't be certain. I will say this, that I don't know. There is a, the governor has stated that he's open to a discussion only first if there are reforms. Um, it's hard to predict that. It's always on the table, but unless the majority party tells us that they're serious about reforming Illinois government, and I gave you some examples that we're never going to have a discussion about a tax increase. Uh, 
but I can't be certain of how a tax increase, if there will be one, because there hasn't been any discussion other than a general discussion talk that new revenue may be needed. And uh, it could be. Uh, our spending levels right now are being controlled by a, one judge, two judges in the federal courthouse in Chicago. And uh, we are expected this year to bring in $33 billion of revenue, but the budget that was passed calls for $36 billion in spending. So uh, we need to get a budget done. I'm hopeful that we can do this in a way in which we are able to perform cuts that are responsible, that are sensitive, uh, but we may have to fill in a gap. But I can't, I don't know what that answer is, sir. I wanna see some good faith out of the other party first, because I'll, I'll, I'll be quite frank. The other party's priority, the Democrat priority, is to have a tax increase. They want additional spending. But there can't be additional spending with no strings attached. That's what happened four and a half years ago. It didn't work. Think about that, 32 billion new dollars that were raised in Illinois off of businesses and families. It didn't get the job done, so we're not gonna be letting our votes go for that easy. We're not, and I'm gonna insist upon that with my caucus. Thank you for coming down here, Senator Durkin, and visiting Egypt. Um, number one, uh, have you considered uh, opting into the federal bankruptcy uh, provision yeah. for the state? We have, oh. for local governments. I don't know if the state of Illinois can file for bankruptcy. Maybe, if, I'm not sure, if, is, your, is your question finished? Are you wanna... The second one is, well, I live in Chicago, uh, where I work from. Even with the minimum economic reforms that you just mentioned, do you think that's sufficient to keep businesses from leaving the state? I have to deal with business development, and I'm not sure if they are. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right, I'll, I'll address the first question. And there's a bill that is still pending in the House of Representatives, which will allow for local governments to seek bankruptcy protection under certain conditions. Right now, if a municipality, mainly the problem they're having is keeping up with their pension funds and making their payments in their pension systems. Uh, we just can't afford them anymore. Um, but you just can't, a municipality just can't walk into bankruptcy court and just say that we're gonna file, seek chapter nine protection. You need to have the state of Illinois has to pass a statute which allows for the filing of that type of action with certain conditions being met. Uh, it's an option. And uh, quite frankly, some local governments are so underwater, there's no way they're gonna get out from it. And uh, putting it in a bankruptcy court, which would be unfortunate, but that's the last, I mean, that's the last of options for some of these municipalities. I would support it. Uh, secondly, business reforms. I'll just tell you about my conversation with the, with the CEO of Caterpillar, Doug Oberhelman. Now, do I, can I look in the magic ball and say that if we're able to pass workman's compensation reform and we also were able to pass unemployment insurance reform, tort reform, whether things overnight are gonna change? Of course not. But I will say this. When I talk to Oberhelman, he goes, the workman's compensation rates that I pay in Illinois are twice as much as they have in Indiana. I need reform, I need causation, reasonable, fair causation standards. I need a list of things that he, need, that he thinks are important for him to at least want to consider uh, opening up a new line of manufacturing. Because his words to me were, I am, I'm, I'm not gonna leave Illinois. Even though he says, I've been offered from Texas, Florida, all these other states, uh, incredible incentives to move our corporate headquarters into the South. I said, I, I'm not gonna leave, but I'll tell you this, unless you guys make changes, particularly with workman's compensation, I'm not opening up a new line of manufacturing in this state. So I will say this, that if we are able to pass those reforms, it's gonna stabilize, and I think it's gonna stop these businesses who've said in the past, you know what, another year goes by, nothing changes. I'm gonna to have to start thinking about leaving out to Wisconsin or Iowa. It's gonna stop this, this flow of businesses and also the people who are part of those jobs out of Illinois. I can't say that it's going to solve our, our, our budget problems, but ultimately it's going to make our, it's gonna stabilize the, the out migration we have of businesses and families. And hopefully at some point, it's gonna make sure that people are gonna look at Illinois as a place that they'll make the investment. So uh, these are important. They're not truly budget issues for this year, uh, but they have to be, but these are issues that are not just short term, they're long term. So you hear the expression, growing back the economy, it's the only way we're gonna do it. And that's how we're gonna make sure these kids are gonna have jobs available for them. Uh, and uh, it's not just Caterpillar, it's Deer. Think of all the great manufacturing uh, plants we've had, have in the state of Illinois, but think of the ones that have shut their doors. 
I mean, I've talked to a number of them over the years of people who are on these Indi um, Indiana borders. I know guys have left, trucking companies have, flown, have left Illinois. So what I'm saying is that we have to be able to make change the environment in Springfield. We have to make changes on a number of business issues. Uh, and I sound like a broken record, but it'll stabilize uh, the current losses that we're having with uh, businesses and also uh, uh, jobs. One more? Okay. I hear, I hear you say that the Democratic legislative leaders are the roadblock. I hear them or read them saying that Governor Rauner is the roadblock. Um, you're one of the three most, well, three most powerful elected Republican officials in the state of Illinois. What can you as an individual do to move the process forward such that these issues and in my mind, the more pressing issue of the budget at a time when state road departments, the county road departments are running out of funds such that sure. you know, they can't buy ice, but they couldn't pay anybody to spread it anyway. How, you know, how, how do you, what can you as, as one of the most powerful politicians in the state do? Well, one, I think that we could probably stop I mean, I, I had to give you a history of how we got here. I'm not going to spend the rest of my days talking about the past. I think, one, we need to have professional discourse and respectable discourse between the parties. But the most important thing that I can do is when I walk into a meeting with the leaders, with the governor, that I'm going to have an open mind on what the priorities for the Democrats are. But they sure as heck better have an open mind of what the priorities are for the Republicans and the governor as well. And if we can do that, we can solve this problem. Uh, no one's ever going to be real happy about what we do in Springfield. But the fact is, we have obligations. We have to get this job done. It sickens me that we don't have a budget. But the fact is, all I can say is that I'm going to walk in to every one of these meetings trying to find a common ground where we can all accept, maybe not be real happy with what we're, they're, we're, they're asking us to do. But that's how we're going to get out of this. But that's how you negotiate. But when you have a divided government, what we have right now with the uh, Governor Rauner, with the Democrats running both chambers, the only way we're going to solve this is going to be through an adult negotiation. And to date, that hasn't happened. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.